Welcome to this week's episode of Musical Talk. Hello, I'm Nick Hudson, and welcome to a very, very special episode of Musical Talk. Now, we haven't announced this episode, we've kept it a bit quiet. If you notice on the website, it says this episode is to be announced. Well, I am now announcing that the Musical Talk today, and by that I mean me, went, or I, even went to the press junket for the Sweeney Todd movie. So, in this episode, you'll be not treated to one interview, but you'll be treated to interviews with Tim Burton, Johnny Depp, Ed Sanders, who plays Tobias, Jamie Campbell Bower, who plays Anthony, Helena Bonham Carter, who plays Mrs. Lovett, Jane Wisner, who plays Joanna, Richard Zanuck, Walter Parks, and Laurie MacDonald, and John Logan, who are the producers. John Logan also wrote the screenplay. But first, I'm going to hand you over to one of the greatest musical theatre writers of all time. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stephen Sondheim. Well, you know, movie musicals have not been uh, very popular uh, uh, up until recently when a couple of them have, have, have suddenly broken through like Chicago. Uh, but, you know, over the last 20 years, uh, movie musicals have not been in great demand. And so I think, you know, it never occurred to anybody. And, and Sweeney was not a, the kind of big hit that made movie studios clamor for it, you know. It, it lost all its money on Broadway, and uh, not, not all, lost half its investment. And it's only over a period of time that it has become sort of more popular and, and more done with revivals and things like that. And as, as you probably know, it was, a, it was a big flop in London. London critics hated it, and, um, uh, which was ironic because it was sort of a love, my love letter to England. And, and so, uh, so I think it's the combination of those things. Um, the uh, the first person uh, first person to ask to do it was in fact Tim about twenty years ago as you, some of you probably know he came to see me and said he wanted to do it as a musical I said wonderful and that was the end of that that we had a nice conversation and I never heard from him again <coughs> he got he got as we say interested in other projects and then a few years ago um, during the record uh, Sam Mendes did a production of Gypsy in New York City and we were having coffee during the recording session and and. And sa- uh, during, uh, during the recording session, we had a, a cup of coffee, and Sam said, uh, have you ever thought of Sweeney Todd as a movie? I said, well, actually, Tim Burton <coughs> once came to me, but otherwise nobody's ever ever, <laughs> ever approached me about it. He said, I'd like to do it. I said, great, let's, let's do it. And he got hold of John Logan, the screenwriter, and they started to work it out together. And then Sam got frustrated by casting. He, the people he wanted to cast, uh, for one reason or another, didn't come through. And so after a couple of years... Sam said, I give up. And then I, I don't know whether, who, I don't actually know exactly who it was who brought it to Tim and said, Are you still interested? And anyway, Tim obviously said yes. And that's what happened. So the bulk of the time was merely the people who were doing uh, movie musicals. And the few movie musicals they did do were big smash hits. And Sweeney was not one of those. So nobody approached me except, as I say, Tim. And then Sam did about, whether it's four or five years ago. Next, Stephen Sondheim was asked what he looks for in a director. Obviously, if, if a director approached me for, for a sh- to do a show as a movie and it was a director whose work I didn't like, I would say no. But uh, that has not arisen because not very many <laughs> directors have asked. Next, about Tim Burton's role. I knew it from the time he came to me 20 years ago that he really loved the story. And that was the first thing. Uh, that he really he likes the story and he likes the musical. And he's not, he's not a particular fan of stage musicals. But something about this spoke to him, and I absolutely trusted that. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, he didn't have to be—he didn't have to be persuaded about the story. The story was, he didn't want to change the story. He wanted the story just the way it was, and all the changes that did occur have to do with small changes within the structure of the story. But he didn't want to change the character. He didn't want to change the ending. He didn't want to change anything about the telling of the tale, and that—that's—that's that's enough. You know, I, I was also enthusiastic about some of his movies, but the real point was that he loved the material. Then we asked Stephen the difference between film and stage. You know, the thing about the stage is you can, do, you can virtually do everything on the stage that you can do in movies. It just depends on the audience's imagination. You can, you can transform... Uh, you, you, you can go from, uh, you know, the Tokyo airport to a hospital interior on the stage just as quickly as you can with a cut in the movie. It all has to do... It just You don't bring in tons of scenery but you do it through suggestion. So offhand, I can't think of anything that couldn't have been done on the stage the way it's done in the movie, except for things like the blood. The blood on the stage shocked the audience. It was compared to what's on the screen, it's that much, but the way it was used and the fact that it was there. 
when Sweeney slits all the throats of the people in the second act, uh, you know, when, when he's, he's singing the, the ballad to Joanna, and he's come to the, now, you know, <laughs> it was a razor this size with a little blood thing in it and a little spouty, but it was their imagination that made it just as big as the blood on the screen. But you have to have more blood on the screen because there, the screen is not about the imagination. The screen is repertorial. The screen is newspaper photography. It, that is real. It doesn't matter whether it's a fantasy or not. You are looking at reality and real people, and therefore it's got to, you have to have more blood. But the effect of the amount of blood on stage was the same as the effect of the blood in the movie. And in fact, in John Doyle's recent production, <coughs> there was no blood on the, uh, on the people themselves, as, as, as those of you who saw it, that just people poured buckets of blood, a bucket of blood into another bucket of blood, and the audience still had the same illusion. And when he finally got to the judge, there were merely more buckets of blood. And so it amounted to exactly the same thing as when Sweeney kills the judge on the screen. We asked what surprised Sondheim in the new film version. The, the middle of the epiphany when, when he cuts away into, into the street and he's threatening everybody in the world. That, yeah, that was a surprise, and I think a brilliant, brilliant surprise. What we did on the stage, the equivalent of that was, there was a little section of the stage, uh, and I had, I had Todd literally threaten the audience. That say, he was threatening the world, and then he suddenly jumped down, and he was as close to the audience as I am to this gentleman right here. People in that, who um, ha, had the misfortune of getting those seats. I mean, I thought, if there's, if there's anybody really elderly, we are in serious trouble. <laughs> because Len Cariou knew how to play murderous anger. He was the guy who played... Sweeney originally, and when he came down and said, you sir, and you, it was as if he was going to break the fourth wall and leap over the, over the stage, because it was that close. This little part of the stage was built out to this little section of the audience on, on stage right, and it was just as scary. It was just, but what, what Tim did in the movie is something you can't do on the stage. Stephen has a huge love for London, so he asked him to go into a bit more detail about that. Useful as the city of London, that really comes from Chris Bond's play. Chris Bond's play is a study in, in uh, actually it's, it's partly about the class system. And the interesting thing about Bond's play is that all the uh, upper class characters speak in a kind of blank verse. It's, it's almost iambic pentameter. And all the lower class people speak in demotic English. Uh, the city of London, therefore, I in the play, is a character uh, a split between those above and those below, as, 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 as the lyric says. One of my collaborators, a man named Bert Shevlov, who was an Anglophile. He's the one who wrote a funny thing out of the way to the Forum. <laughs> and in fact, with the money that, that he earned from Forum, he moved immediately to London and, he, and lived here for the rest of his life. Uh, and um, he introduced me to uh, the puzzles in The Listener, The Old Listener. And I became fascinated because I love puzzles. I love cryptic puzzles, which did not exist in the United States. You may, those of you who do British puzzles, they never existed in the United States until I'm happy to say I wrote them for New York Magazine, and then now, now they're very popular there. But the listener puzzles I like because they were gimmicky, and I like the Zimnies puzzles in The Observer. And I've been a subscriber to The Observer ever since because even though Zimnies died, I got in the habit of subscribing to The Observer. So I have been au courant a bit with what goes on in, uh, in popular culture and theatrical culture, and et cetera, in England since I was 28 years old, 27 years old, which is the first time I actually came to London and just loved it. So I'm afraid the, the Anglophilia has, has, no, has no deeper roots than the Zimini's crossword puzzles and, and the Listener crossword puzzles. But I got habituated, and the first time I came, actually the first time I came to London I was 22, but that was sort of passing through. The first time I stayed in London was uh, when West Side Story was done here, and I just, you know, I, I don't think I've had a year since when I haven't been here at least once. Stephen was then asked for his general opinion on the film and if he thought the film suffered from not having singers playing the main roles. I found the film stunning and was quite surprised how stunned I was, even though I knew what was going to be done. But see, because I was not around during the actual filming, I was only here for the recording sessions. And so, I, outside, of, uh, outside of seeing sort of rushes, uh, which I had seen a lot of, I had never seen sequences put together. And um, since I received the rushes on a computer and they often were slow and sort of thing. I didn't see all the rushes because there was no fun. So this, in that sense, the film was a, a kind of fresh experience for me. And I, w I must say, I was, I was knocked out by it. I was, I was surprised also at how knocked. I was knocked out at how knocked out I was. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, no, I've always preferred actors who sing, singers who act. And uh, all the shows I've ever done, I, 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 and which I, I, get, uh, I get some flack for and some resistance from colleagues for because 
Um, I'm interested in storytelling. I mean, w what I like about songwriting is songs used to tell a story. That's why I don't write songs apart from theatrical pieces. I'm not interested in writing songs, qua songs. I like songs that are part of, of, a, of a dramatic texture. And therefore, I like, I like the scenes to be acted. I, like, I want to follow the story, and that means you lean on the actors. And so I'm used to what I would call untrained singing. If there had been anybody in the film, if any of the leading roles had been cast with a professional capital S singer, then it would have been out of balance, I think it would not have worked so well. But they all, they're merely actors who are musical, all of them, with the exception of Laura Michelle, who really you know, has had a career on, on the stage here as a singer. And, um, but even she tamped down her voice, and she, and she has very little to sing in the movie. But if she'd had any, any big aria, then it would have required that everybody else either come up to her or go down in terms of the quality of the singing, of the professionality, the sheen. You can tell a professional singer from a non-professional singer. So they're all of a quality, and that's why I think it works so well. I asked Stephen how one goes about adapting a score from the stage to the screen. Yes, adaptation in terms of cutting certain sections of songs out where there wa wasn't anything active to film. Um, the trouble with, with m most musicals that have been done for the screen, in fact, all the musicals that have been made from stage musicals, is that they are essentially films of the stage musicals. Uh, and the, the songs are used as songs. Uh, what, what, what Tim wanted, and, and Logan and I also, was that if a song does not lend itself, on, on stage, you can sit and listen to a song being sung for three, four, five minutes, because that's the convention, and you can enjoy it, because it's taking a moment and expanding it, or as Bert Sheldon said, savoring the moment. But on the screen, at least I, as a, as a movie fan, I want the story to be told. I want it to go swiftly. So that meant that we had to excise certain parts of the songs and, and excise certain songs. So I would look towards, if, if Tim or Logan said to me, could we get from this point to that point more quickly, I'd find a way of compressing or omitting or alighting so that it would still maintain the shape of a song, of the song, without having to... Uh, I, I can give you numerous examples. There's a whole middle section of Green Finish and Lin Linnet Bird, which is cut. There's a whole middle section of uh, Little Priest, which is cut. But unless you know the score, you wouldn't know it. I, I like to think you wouldn't know that anything was, anything was cut. I might be wrong, but I think you wouldn't know. And I bet a lot of people who only know the score superficially will not notice, not notice those omissions. But uh, those, are, those are the things I worked out. Uh, to, so, the, so the movie could be told, as you all saw, swiftly. You know, it's an hour and 45 minutes long, probably, and it tells a, a moderately uh, a, a, a rich story in that time with, and yet people sing, which is, lo when you sing, it takes longer than when you speak. And yet, I, for my money, it does, it does not seem attenuated. It, it doesn't seem as if it's a taffy ball. Stephen was then asked if, when the actors had to audition in front of him, if he relished his power upon them. Oh, I, I, I've, I've spent my entire life relaxing actors and saying, mm -hmm. don't, please, I'm, 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 I'm by nature generous. I hate the idea that people feel that they're auditioning. And all I'm there to do is to help them be confident. The whole thing about dealing with people who have not sung professionally before is giving them the confidence to sing. It's as simple as that and as hard as that. To give somebody confidence. They have confidence in acting, but they have very little confidence or no confidence in singing. And the only way they can, you can do that is to support them and just rehearse them and gentle them. I mean, you know, so, you no, know, I get no pleasure whatsoever out of their discomfort. Stephen was then asked about the style of writing he uses for his shows. Well, I, I change my style for each show. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, you know, there are foxes and hedgehogs, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a fox. I go, uh, I, I don't dig one, <coughs> one place deep. I, I scour the field. And, um, uh, and uh, the, the, the style for Sweetie Todd is entirely different than the style for any other show I've written. But I would claim that I was true of each show I've written, that, the, that I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in content dictating form and style. And, uh, you know, if you're going to write company, then you write that kind of score. If you're going to write Pacific Overtures, you're going to write that kind of score. And if you're going to write Sweeney Todd, you write that kind of score. Uh, so there are other composers who would use the same style for each. It's neither good nor bad. It's, it's who you are as a composer. I'm an eclectic, and I always have been. We then sat down with two of the film's producers, Walter Parks and Lloyd MacDonald, and also John Logan, who wrote the screenplay and also produced the film. They discussed their involvement with the film. Uh, Laurie and I met with Steve Sondheim, I think, in 2002, originally. And um, 
you know, had conversations at the time we were also running the studio. And for whatever reason, you know, Steve Steve felt comfortable that we would, you know, love the baby like our own and do whatever we could to make sure that it was came to the screen the right way. And within weeks, I think, right. John, John, Laurie, and I have, have collaborated many, many times since, but we really got to know each other or cut our teeth together on Gladiator. John, I, I, I feel, really wrote the draft that, that kind of became Gladiator and, and made, got the movie made and had been a man of the theater and a lover of, of this play and quite extraordinarily, I think, came to us. Oh, and, and I think on, on yeah. bended knee yeah. and yeah. said, if I don't write this, I'll die. Yes, so. yes. It was actually, in fact, a Gladiator, which we all collaborated on, which made us feel that we had the right to take a shot with such a, you know, unusual and potentially difficult material. Speaking for me, Lori, we had run the studio for several years, DreamWorks, and it was a very good run, and, and you know, th there's a connection p that people have to Sweeney Todd that really does border on the fanatic. I mean, people who love the play love the play in a very, very deep way. That's something, the three of us share a lot of things. That was one of the things right. I think we all shared. But it isn't an obviously commercial venture. I mean, it's a very risky thing mm -hmm. to do. So it really, for us as, as producers, it kind of took the confidence that we derived from a couple years there of things working and working together on Gladiator and seeing right. how well that worked to say, you know something, we can try this. We can try to do this the right way. Right, and also, it, you know, everyone at the early stages in this, Walter Lowe and I, we all saw the original 1979 Broadway production of this. Um, and it has stayed with us since then and have such affection for and respect for the work of, of Stephen Sondheim and Hugh Wheeler and Chris Bonner and Hal Prince, maybe people who made that uh, original Broadway production. That was paramount to me all the way through. That from the very beginning, we were all talking about the same, the same beast and talking about it with respect. Absolutely. I remember, you know, you, you started your whole process with an almost like academic analysis and study and breakdown of the original play. I right. mean, I think you became a scholar of the... <laughs> of <Swing laughs> oh, those many years ago, yeah, yeah. No, because yeah. there's such extraordinary, invisible work John had to do. Because it, no one wanted to reinvent the wheel here, right. at least on a screenplay level. We wanted to honor, as John said, this amazing piece of work that is only grown in stature since its inception. And, and you know, I, I think it's always been thought to be the most important score of the last of the mm. second part of the of the yes. 20th century and, and it's such a great story. So anyway, to, to answer your story, um, that was a very long process and there was quite a long process of trying to find different ways of getting the movie made and eventually we parted ways w w w with, with Sam. And at that point, I remember a conversation the, the three of us had and, and, and it really was, well there's all these versions of Sweeney Todd which are going to be you know, hopefully we'll, we'll respectable and we'll go out there and we'll put on film this wonderful piece of work and we'll find its little audience. And then there's this other version and that would be a version with Tim and Johnny. It's like suddenly, oh my lord, it could have a larger cultural impact possibly just because of what they bring to it. And also the fact that there's such a perfect kind of correspondence between Tim's sensibility and what the sensibility of the play itself is. So we were lucky enough to engage in conversations with the various uh, representatives, and yes, Tim came in. And quite honestly, Tim is such a total auteur that when you make a movie with Tim, you hand the baton to Tim. From the very beginning, the first discussion we had with, with Tim that. Burton, we talked about um, the blood. And, and one of the unforgettable things on, in the stage shows, the first stage setting, you remember this, the blood arcing across the stage, the light hitting it. We talked about the blood from the very beginning and said, it would be dishonest, immoral, and unethical to treat this as anything other than murder and to, and to try to shy away from, from, from the blood. We then sat down with the delightful Miss Helena Bonham Carter, who talked about how she first discovered Mrs. Lovett aged 13. Well, I saw it when I was 13. When I first heard it, um, I was 13, and I loved it. I loved the score. And I, it was before, it was, before it had come over, it was in America, New York. And... Uh, I loved it. Contrary to common belief, Helena has to audition for any film that she and Tim Burton do. We asked her what the audition process for this film was like. I had, he, you know, he came to me and he said, look, you know, over dinner once, I am going to do Sweeney Todd, which we both knew we loved. It was one of the things we, one of our mutual passions was the musical. I remember when we were, you know, getting together, we played it. We caught it over Sweeney Todd. But, um, so he knew that I, would, and I, he also knew that I've always wanted to learn to sing. So he said, look, how about this? I think you're right for that. You know, I want you to be considered because you shouldn't be not considered just because you go out with me. However, you're going to have to audition. 
along with anybody else who wants to, because I'm going to audition anybody who wants to go up for it because they have to sing, you know. And uh, so he said, you know, it's up to you. And I said, of course, of course I'll go for it because, you know, if I don't get the part, at least I'll have learned to sing or, you know, had the voice lessons that I've always wanted to do anyway. So um, so I went to a singing teacher who's fantastic. So you had the voice lessons and, and the, for the Yeah, I And worked. the composer uh, to And Sondheim, yes. oh, that was the other thing. Tim didn't, he said, you know, okay, and on top of that, I don't want to have ultimate approval. It's, it's Sondheim who will ultimately cast. Yeah. So... Um, it was scary. Uh, I just had no choice because I so loved Sondheim, you know, and I I so love his the, love the part, and I loved the material and the music and the lyrics, and he's a genius. So I just I can't lose, you know. It's a tall order anyway. Learn to sing in three months. So I thought if I don't, you know, I'll have a good excuse if I don't get it, you know. So so I did it, and I, I was amazed the day when Sondheim. I mean, even Tim. I I auditioned for Tim on video, and he didn't talk about it for five weeks. That was tough. But then he auditioned other people. Didn't talk about it. He didn't take. We didn't talk about it. It was like the elephant in the room for five weeks, and then, and then finally he said, "You know what? I think you are right. You know, and you can sing this part." He then, luckily, sometime a week later, you know, saw them and he agreed with Tim. And also, you know what? I didn't want to be cast if I was not up to it. I would have hated it, and I didn't want it. You know, it would have been horrible to film and horrible for me and horrible for us. So we just had to go through that. We asked Helena what first attracted her to the musical. I think, to be honest, the music, for some reason, viscerally, the music and the there's some such beautiful tunes, frankly. And there's a yearning and there's a sort of romance to it. Uh, and humour. And, like, there's number like Pretty Women and Joanna and uh, I love Little Priest, too. Um... I just loved the music, and it was, it's uh, so heartrending. We asked her about Mrs. Lovett as a character. Well, what I loved about it, and what's, you know, is because she was so complex, and she could, she could have so many different colours, and you could, you could still play it in billions of different ways. Mm. That's always the exciting thing with a part, where it's well written, is that you can, so many different ideas occur to you, you know. Do you think she's the baddie? In this I don't think she's a baddie, I think they're both victims in a way, I mean... Mm. I mean, she's the most immoral, amoral. She's got no excuses for what she does. He's he's obviously innately a victim given what's happened to him. So you can kind of justify um, his killing. <laughs> you see a reason behind it, you know, a powerlessness, and he goes off the end. And she's amoral, and it's not quite explained why she's quite so um, innate. She's pretty mad and delusional herself. Uh-huh. And that's her tragedy. She's in love with somebody who doesn't even notice her. We asked about the difficult musical staging that this film has. You had to rehearse it and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse it and practice it because um, it's different because on fil- on stage you have to do it all in one. On film you know it's going to be cut around but because it's cut around you have to do it in continuity so you have to really learn it back to front to know when you're going to pick up the rolling pin, when you're going to smash it, smash the, you know, the dough. It's all written into the music. The pie making is written into the rhythm of the music and he actually, you know, all the offbeats are smashing the pastry and the but um, it all had to be decided which you know which bit was I going to roll the pastry out when I was going to and which beat was going to be what and you obviously had to do it immaculately the same every single time you did it so uh, it's hard it was hard it was a lot I I know that song I could sing it in my no the rhythms are all over but they're fascinating and the once you start looking at it there's a reason for every single break of a rhythm you know it's not all over the place it's really easy to learn in a way in some ways because it's justified by its own logic and its own the thinking behind it and there's always a character a reason for why you know it goes up on it or seems perverse you know or there's an offbeat and it's all there like in that worst part it's like a minute and a half you're in and you kind of know her already it's like bang you know she's somebody who just Chatterholic. It's like a monologue. We were then joined by the 14-year-old Ed Sanders, who plays Tobias. I asked him what it felt like to be singing a great musical theatre standard. Um, it, it's it's an amazing feeling. It's yeah, it's, it's quite quite scary. But um, I, I've, I've I'm very happy with how it how it came out in the end. Um, but definitely the musical side of um, film. I think it I think it's definitely um, having its time at the moment. Um, I, I think I think it uh, I think it would be very good. I spoke to Jane Wisner, who plays Joanna, and Jamie Campbell Bauer, who plays Anthony, and we were talking about the differences between England and America and what they like best about America. I tell you, I really like the sweets. Well, apart from their chocolate, 
But yeah, I like. I just like. I like the accent. I like the lifestyle. I like. I don't know. I like my lifestyle too. I like the British way as well. Do you think London has become very similar to New York? No. 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 <laughs> so just, just shoot you down. Yeah, I think London. I, I mean, London's. You know kind of where it all began really you know London's it's like, an incredible place the grass is always greener as they say so. yeah probably I, I can't live in Hollywood I can't leave London it's too it's too good I, yeah I don't know I think LA's kind of fake it kind of it's it, I mean it obviously you know it is and it's it, it doesn't I mean you know you've got to play the game but I wouldn't want to play the game 24-7 I spoke to costume designer Cody Natwood and asked her how difficult it was to research a Victorian barber. It was tricky. No, there weren't photo. There were photographs later, but um, a lot of it was sort of cartoon, um, sort of character drawings. So I kind of took that and then took the little bit later research and then sort of made it up in between because there's a lot of research about barbers before, like. Um, before 1800, like funny cartoons of them because of the wigs and all that, and then this sort of yeah, yeah. We were then joined by the delightful Alan Rickman, who shared his thoughts on making the movie. It was great to do the movie because I was working with great filmmakers and great actors and and a great script with great music. So you know, it was a more than fun. It was a privilege. We asked him if he'd ever seen again on stage or screen. Well, let's wait and see if I'm asked. Uh, but yeah, why not? If uh, you know, maybe it'll inspire Mr. Sondheim to write something maybe specific for the movies. We then asked if there are any films that Alan would like to see adapted into a musical. I can't think of one offhand because you know usually there's a whole problem with them on film is that there are so much of the theatre that it's very hard to move them. Um, but I thought what was wonderful about this is that it naturally moves to the screen because everything is, a, is so interior and it's about people's thought processes wow. and, uh, and about a very dark world, so it's not happy-go-lucky um, leg-kicking choruses or anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's a so it's a, it's a movie you know, that is not trying to be something else. Did you ever see the original Broadway or West End production of Sweeney Todd? Yeah, I saw it only once. Uh, I didn't see Angela Lansbury do it originally, um, but I saw it a couple of years ago with Paddy Lupone and um, Michael Severus in New York, where they were all playing musical instruments as well. And that was... It was amazing, but it's like a, co a completely different piece of work. I don't recognise what we've done as opposed to what they did. We asked Alan about the influence that American actors have in England and vice versa. I think that those um, barriers are all over the place these days. I think it's very easy to try to make up some so-called truth about that, but I don't think any of it's true anymore. You now have... In the last couple of years, three classic English characters. If you say that three archetypal English characters would be Bridget Jones, Jane Austen, and Queen Elizabeth. You have them played by a couple of Americans and Australian. And Sweeney Todd, of course. Yeah, and it? Sweeney Todd. Um, uh, but you have an American playing of all people, Jane Austen. <laughs> so I think all of these things should be screwed up and thrown away and we should let English people and American people dive into the mix and if you can do it, do it, you know. What's happened is that we've got better at doing American accents and they've got much better at doing English accents. So it's, you know, it's all moving around now. So you have people like Kate Winslet playing American parts as often as she plays English and and vice versa and Johnny Depp playing a lot of English. We asked Alan which character is more loathsome, the judge he plays in Sweeney Todd or the character he played in Dangerous Liaisons? Um, maybe Sweeney Todd himself or maybe Mrs Lovett or... <laughs> It's not the way I look at it, I suppose. Uh, I can't argue with the way you, you look at it, but uh, I'm looking down the other end of the telescope at, as you say, other work as well. So it's all part of And also the last thing I do is say, I'm playing somebody horrible. I'm just playing this person. Who is it? What do they want? What do they think? Where do they come from? 
how do you think the movie will um, play for today's modern audiences? That's the jolly Christmas option. <laughs> 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 a bit of singing and dancing. I honestly don't know. I mean, one would hope that the world has not so, excuse me, fucked itself that it can't uh, go to see a movie that is dark and complex and takes them somewhere they don't know about. If all people want to do is pay money to go to the movies and have all their preconceptions reaffirmed and come out of a movie or a theatre or a book or a piece of music or anything else with everything still in place and everything exactly the way it was when they went in, then we all have the world and the culture and the art that we deserve and we will blow ourselves up. We mentioned how important it was for the small movies trying to make it in the business. I agree with you. Thank God for the little independent movie. Unless it becomes part of general culture and it's made available it's already you know you can if you live in new york or la or london you're living in luxury land in terms of choice but you live in the the backwards of the north of england a hundred miles to go see a movie we asked alan about the strikes and mentioned the possible forthcoming sag strike in july there are i'm a solid union person and uh, and it's an honorable fight i think so uh, all I know is that there are no movies without scripts and there are certainly no good movies without scripts and so the writers deserve it's ludicrous how little respect they give and it, it's criminal what's going on So um, and it's only about greed and so good luck to them really I think uh, there, there are rumours that Harry Potter is going to be turned into a musical how oh really? <laughs> Who's, who's shoving that one around? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, there are. You can go and find Harry Potter porn sites. On really? The, oh, I'm not kidding, and people are proud of it. It's a don't go area, so anything's possible. <laughs> Harry Potter the musical after Harry Potter the porn site. And now we bring you to the star of the film, Johnny Depp, and the director, Tim Burton. The first question we asked Johnny was how is it that he's able to take so many risks when it comes to films and also what is it about the film that inspired him so much? I think it's, it's, a, it's probably a combination of a, or, or something in between hard-headed and ignorant you know, in terms of you, you know, doing the, doing, taking the road that I've taken you know, but uh, cause there's an easier one out there for sure um, and then, and then, this you know, Sweeney Todd. First of all, it, that, that's one thing. You know, that's one sort of little arena. But you know, Tim comes into the picture before all that. You know, anything that he would ask me to do, I'd jump at the opportunity. Except a ballet. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I actually would. You're not gonna do that. <laughs> I, so. I would. I would try. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I was familiar to some degree with the, with the, you know, the, uh, the earlier versions, the, the stuff that, you know, that seen the, the video of, of um, Angela Lansbury and, and, and listened to it quite extensively, and and uh, I'd seen the more recent uh, production of it, and, and just thought it might be, you know, certainly a great opportunity to, to try to <coughs> find a, a new Sweeney, a different Sweeney, uh, kind of uh, in a weird way, I suppose, like a. Uh, slightly more contemporary in the sense of like a, almost like a punk rock Sweeney. Johnny went on to talk about the nerve shredding experience of singing these very famous songs. I was, I think I was probably more frightened than anyone, <laughs> except, except maybe Tim. No, um, he was actually, he was amazingly, uh, you know, he, he, he really trusted me with it, you know, and, and, and I, you know, I, I was, I was very lucky that he allowed me to, because, I didn't have a process, really, you know, in terms of singing. I never sang before in my life, so, uh, so, so I had to kind of find my way to it, and um, and thought it was important that I, you know, keep it very, very low key, and, and so yeah, I initially did, did these demos in a uh, in my friend's garage studio, you know, and because uh, I didn't know if I would be able to hit a note, to be honest, I really didn't. You know. I just w- I wanted to make sure I could do it f- for Tim, and then so then when we did I think the first demo we cut was my friends, 
and I and I sent it to uh, I sent it to Tim. You know, and crossed my fingers and waited waited for the outcome. You know. Next, we asked Johnny if he thought the role of Todd's revenge was an act of loneliness as a victim, or was it a violent reaction that became more violent? It's probably all of that, you know, you know, layer by layer, you know, one, one thing leads to another, you know, I think initially, yeah, victim, um, uh, victim who dreams of revenge becomes obsessed with that dream of revenge, and then from there it turns into, uh, uh, yeah, like a compulsion, obsession, uh, uh, you know, madness, um, and that's the only thing you you have, the only thing that drives you, the only thing that keeps you alive is the idea of... Tim Burton spoke about Helena's role in the film. I thought it was important that, because uh, I'd never done anything like this before myself, so, uh, and it's a, quite a difficult musical to do, and, you know, like in the stage thing, that was a, you know, that was a, it's a hard role, all the roles are hard. And I just didn't want it to seem like I was just giving the job to my girlfriend or anything. So uh, I really was probably harder on that for that reason. And I just wanted to make sure that uh, it was basically she was really, really right for it, which she is, it, which she was and is. So, yeah, I probably was a bit harder on her than, than others for the reason of just wanting to really make sure it was right. Many may draw comparisons between this film and Edward Scissorhands for obvious reasons. We asked Tim Burton and Johnny Depp about this link. For me, it's only the fact that we did that movie and we did this movie. I mean, you know, and we're not lost on the, you know, the the sharp instrument angle. But, you know, the thing about this character, which I love, is different from that, is that you know, we did that a long time ago and we were probably much more, I certainly was much more optimistic in you know, which that character sort of represented. And now, the, Sw- the Sweeney character is a much sort of more interiorized, darker character, which I, which I love. And seeing Johnny do both of those things was really amazing for me to see because, uh, uh, y- you know, I think this character for me is one of my favorite characters he's done just because I, I love the interior brooding quality of, of the character. And then you put that with him singing and it just created to me a really amazing new thing for me. Similarities in the sense that to Sijan's maybe even Sleepy Hollow and Ichabod Crane in a way of characters who were kind of very much uh, like we was talking about living inside their own head um, uh, kind of thing. Edward was a, was a bit more innocent than that, you know, to be aware of it. Uh, yeah, no, I think there was only one moment when you saw Edward get angry. Yeah, no, this guy's just this guy's angry just the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> there might be one moment when you just smile. <laughs> yeah, it's like if Edward Scissorhands, you know, went into a major depression and got <laughs> angry with that. For, for several years. We asked Johnny, who I must say at this conference donned a very handsome goatee, if, in the making of this film, he'd learnt the value of a good shave. Um, you know what? Th- no, I didn't. I really didn't. I've never, I've never really experienced that full, that full on thing because this, this is, is a full beard for me. I'm actually, this is a lumberjack look for me. I'm hiding <laughs> behind this. So yeah, no, I didn't, uh, I didn't. But I, but I, can, but I can definitely appreciate it because uh, when you, when you get in there with, a, you know, into the chair with a strange, stranger, complete stranger, and uh, yeah, they lather your face up and. and brings an incredibly sharp uh, instrument towards your throat. So. <laughs> yeah, it's very yeah. frightening. It is. I, I, I tried it once, and it was really frightening to have a complete stranger have a razor at your throat. You don't even know who he is. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's just the sound of it. It's, it's, it's a quite a... It's frightening, in a way. I don't... We asked Tim Burton how Sasha Baron Cohen was cast. Well, I mean, it was, it was after Borat came out, and I, I was... You know, he came in... To audition, he brought in the score of Fiddler on the Roof and basically did all of Fiddler on the Roof in the studio. <laughs> and no, he was great, you know, because I, I admired him because you know he could have gone off and done a whole bunch of different stuff, but you know he chose to do this, and that was you know he, it, it was it was great that he did it. God, I'd love to have seen that. Wow. Oh yeah, it was. I wish he had a camera because wow. he literally went through the whole score of <laughs> Fiddler on the Roof. It was <laughs> the whole book. Oh, wow. It was great. We asked if the difficult blending of genres, being a musical and a slasher, 
how that has an effect on uh, Tim Burton's mind and whether it keeps him awake at night. Well, I mean, it, you know, it's always a, a, a risk. I mean, it, of course, uh, y- y- you know, I remember when I first saw the show uh, in London back when I was still a student, or basically, um, you know, I didn't know anything about the musical, and I remember seeing the show and right when Joanna came, these two ladies these very proper British ladies were sitting in front of me and they were kind of chatting throughout the show mm-hmm. and then when Joanna came up and the you know the blood started spurting across the stage they both stopped <laughs> and paused for a minute and one leader and they said was that really necessary <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but in fact it was necessary and I've seen other productions of it where you know, they tried to be a bit more politically correct and skimp on it, and it really lost something because, I mean, the show is based in those old Grand Guignol, uh, y- you know, horror theater uh, melodramas where, you know, they had buckets pouring out over the stage. So it just felt like that was true to the spirit of what the show is, it was, and is, and, and so, and it's over the top, too, so we never felt like it was. You, you know, it, it's, it's more of an emotional release than it is kind of a, a, a reality thing in this movie so it, it and the studio they were cool about it they accepted it they knew it because they knew that the, what the show was so there wasn't you know but it, you know anything any movie is a risk but it's nice to be able to do something like that where you know it doesn't fit into either musical or slasher movie category kind of his own category Sweeney Todd in the film is a very depressed character and we asked Johnny Depp are there any moments in the film where Sweeney Expresses moments of happiness. Um, I don't know. I haven't seen the film. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, the funny thing is, that, you know, the majority of the filming was like was it like a laugh riot. We were we were constantly kind of you know it was it was a great time. It was a great you know, experience. It was great fun. You know, we, we laughed like fiends. Uh, I mean, I'd say the humor, from from my point of view, from his character, comes from how just serious he is and just how single-minded he is. Thanks. Goodbye. Uh, you know, the relationship he has in with with Mrs. Love and anybody else, you know, he's pretty much on <coughs> one track. And, you know, I, there's something weirdly humorous about that, but I guess it depends on, you know, what yeah. you think is funny, really. For Tim Burton and Johnny Depp, we asked each what they get out of the other. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say, you know, he just tries anything. I mean, the fact is that he's not a, a singer, you know, he's musical, but th- and then he would try, like, one of the hardest musicals ever to do, uh, you know, is like, it just says it all, you know, he's just willing to go out there. And believe me, something I learned is singing is very exposed, especially if you're not a singer, it's, it's a very exposing process, and... Uh, I just really, you know, anybody that can do that can basically do anything, you know, and 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 so it's, for me, it's just a artistic pleasure to see somebody try different things and and actually achieve it and and achieve it beyond your expectations. So, With Tim, I mean, since the first second that we met, you know, you know, all those years ago in that little cafe, you know, coffee shop in in, in Los Angeles. The, for for me, there was a there was a kind of instant connection uh, on 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 a lot of different levels. I mean, the most obtuse levels of you know where you know this kind of weird fascination or understanding of, of absurdity, the absurdity of things that were totally you know perfectly acceptable in the 1970s, for example, like macrame owls and resin grapes and you know <laughs> you know fake fruit. <laughs> on your plastic fruit on your kitchen table that no one thought you know, twice about. Um, so that there's that weird connection right on the spot. And since ever since then, I, I, I um, have only wanted to, as an actor, you know, as a friend, but I mean as an actor, give, just give him as much of what, as close to what he wants or what I, what I think he wants, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, any any actor's job really is to just give the director options, you know, just give him a bunch of options. So uh, I mean, I, I funny thing is I like, for example, when I go into a movie and I'm preparing like a character or whatever, and I start these start getting these kind of you know these ideas that come to me and begin to incorporate them into the character. 
I feel good about it myself and, you know, have hopes that others will feel the same, you know, you know. But when I'm working with Tim, as I'm coming up with the character, I'm, before I'm thinking about what I feel about the character, I'm thinking about him. I'm just hoping that I won't let him down. So, so he comes first, and then I, and then I come in there. You know, Another thing is he, he's great, because I love, he doesn't like looking at himself, which is great for me. You know, <laughs> I mean, you don't have to spend, you know, oh, after the, mon you know, after take, I'm going to go look, you know, and see, oh, that's not a good, you know, he's just completely open to like, okay, whatever, you know, and I don't really care to look at myself or want to look at myself, you know, he just does a great job. And uh, believe me, that's a huge issue for me to not have that kind of, you know, sort kind of vanity of like looking at yourself and you, you know stopping. It kind of keeps the process going, keeps it vital, and, and and that that means a lot to me. And I think the crew and everybody else they get they get into the spirit of like just doing it, you know, and not sitting around and you know. Analyzing. We asked Tim Burton if the unique visual style in the film represents his view on the world. Well, I mean, you know, we our our inspiration for this was these old horror movies and all. So you know. We wanted to make the characters look like that, you know. Johnny and I always talked about like old horror movie actors and, and all. Uh, so it was an opportunity to do that. So you set the world in that, and you know, so it's for the flashbacks because that was the, you know, you just try to treat it like the story. You know, that was the happier time in his life. So, you know, it's a bit more lurid. The color, you know, sort of the opposite of flashbacks, which usually are more desaturated. We sort of inverted that because that seemed to be more appropriate to the telling of the story and then you know her fantasy we put a lot of color into because that's her fantasy of a wonderful life and and so you know you just try to use color as a as an emotional character and and, and that's why we made those those choices and finally we asked tim burton what it was like not to work with danny elfman for once well you know the score was already done i mean that's one of the reasons yeah. i did this but i think danny would appreciate this score because you know sondheim when i first we first talked to him he said uh he wrote the score as like a Bernard Herrmann score, which it, it was interesting when we recorded the the orchestra. And you don't hear the vocals; it's really like a great old-fashioned yeah. movie score. So you know, it had the same kind of strength that Danny. You know, I usually get with working with Danny, but uh, you know, there was such a wealth of of music and themes in the you know that Sondheim wrote that. You, you know, uh, it was all there right from the very beginning. I'm here with my friends uh, Paul and Heather. Say hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, who have seen the Sweeney Todd film and are about to share their thoughts on it. Paul, what do you think of it? Um, I thought the Sweeney Todd film was a masterpiece, actually. I thought it was, as, uh, I thought it was an extraordinary um, fusion of, um, of visuals and music and uh, incredible performances by... Um, uh, by everyone, I thought Depp was Johnny Depp was amazing in the movie. Uh, I thought Helena Bonham Carter was fabulous. It looked it looked incredible. Uh, I loved it. It was one of the best films I think I've seen this year, actually. Hello. I have to admit that this is the first time I've ever seen Sweeney Todd, and I haven't been familiar with the story up until now. So when I first saw it, I thought it was very dark, very disturbing, but I also thought it was incredibly beautiful and touching. I thought it was one of the greatest romantic tragedies I've seen in a very long time. And uh, how did Johnny Depp live up to your standards, Paul? Well, I've always thought that he was an incredibly um, diverse actor, and I think he takes risks as an actor. The Nocky, <laughs> please. Uh, there. Johnny Depp loves Nocky, um, okay, and sandwich. apparently... That's mine, thank you. Apparently, he also loves club sandwiches as well, and yeah, I think he takes amazing risks as an actor, and he carries himself off as an actor rather than as a big movie star. And I loved his performance in this. I thought he also, I thought his singing was fine. I, I really liked his singing in the movie. What, do you, what about you, Heather? Do you think he's singing in the film? I loved his singing in the film. I didn't realize he could sing on such a level that he did. In the in the movie and mixed vegetables. Yes, and the chips, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Paul. You can have your fries that are going to add to your heart attack one day soon. Oh, Heather, by the way, she's really a pain in the ass. <laughs> I 
but hurt you. Yeah. I'm looking forward. But anyway, um <laughs> You are editing this, right? I'm really Maybe. Sorry. I think this is quite funny, though. I'm really sorry about Paul. He's very obnoxious and says very inappropriate things. If the word is, excuse me. First of all, it's inappropriate is the I word. Said you said inappropriate. I said inappropriate. We'll play it back. Maybe you should listen. She's American. She doesn't know what she's saying. Carry on. <gasps> and I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much to our guests Stephen Sondheim, Water Parks, Loy McDonald, John Logan, Jane Wisner. Helena Bonham Carter, Jamie Campbell Bauer, Ed Sanders, Colin Atwood, Johnny Depp, Tim Burton, my friends Heather and Paul, all the staff at Claridge's Hotel, all the staff at Paramount, all the staff at Warner Brothers, and a special thank you to BroadwayWorld.com. And thank you for listening to this episode of Musical Talk. We shall see you next week. Bye bye. This has been a production of Musical Talk, copyright 2007.